I would like to start with some stories that the Chinese scroll from the Ukrainian collection tell. And we start with the night nice scene, as I've already mentioned, and it shows the intellectuals, the statesmen, alas, there were no stateswomen at the time, who are possibly reading poetry and writing poetry, who are possibly um, practicing calligraphy and, uh, or, or drawing something, who are expecting their servants to bring some special treats. They are contemplating a flowering, a flowering garden. Uh, they are spending an intellectual gather gathering. And these sorts of um, parties, um, high-rank parties, were well known since, I would say, for, at least for the last 2,000 years, for, for, for the um, very complicated occasions, like to discuss, discuss moral thing, uh, moral issues, uh, or just to enjoy poetry, to uh, um, create poetry, write on the spot, and to improvise, to taste wine, to taste uh, tea, uh, to smell incense. It was, I would put it uh, in the modern words, uh, that would be uh, the multimodal experience for them. And those were for the elites who could, those only people who could gather in the night time. And we can see that it is night time from these uh, like uh, clouds of uh, mist and the burning ca candles here. So the common people would not uh, have a party like that. Mm, and these, uh, this sort of um, composition, uh, the depiction of intellectuals, is known from the late 11th century. No uh, scroll have survived, uh, has survived to, sh like to show the initial painting, but it was replicated multiple times. And it, uh, it gets some new meanings, uh, new uh, characters were added, uh, new nuances of compositions. And that was to um, highlight uh, themselves, those elites, and to show everybody like their uh, intellectual powers, their refined tastes. And the uh, Chinese painting was always the art of elite for the elite. And the Chinese uh, society was very strict in all the demands towards men and women, um, if officials, laymen and like. But still in that elitist art, there was a certain hint to something vivid, some mockery, uh, something that will uh, go out of those strict structures. So now I would ask you to move this way. And we are about to talk what's depicted in this uh, painting. So uh, this uh, composition is known from at least, I would say, uh, the uh, person who created it uh, lived from uh, 1494 to 1552. And also we have a fake inscription of the author who lived like a more, almost a generation before him, Tang Ying, uh, who lived from uh, 1470 to 1524. So, uh, the author of the initial painting uh, was uh, like a very, of, of a very modest uh, origin, uh, but he managed to uh, like break that glass ceiling of the Chinese society and became the court painter. And he painted a lot, the intellectuals, the, um, uh, the women of court and like, uh, but he also um, addressed some ideas of uh, the so-called parallel universe, we would call it right now. Like, you imagine the uh, pictures of uh, um, Christmas trees around, uh, around a human and like. So this is a more kind of a mockery uh, that um, is a parody to the intellectuals and their achievements and also their um, 
uh, will to spread the knowledge uh, to enlighten the lay people. So here we have an intellectual who has probably established a school in his um, village. Uh, he wants to share his knowledge, he wants uh, people to be educated, and he gathered these uh, children, all male children, as you see, um, but something went wrong because he had fallen asleep and one of the kids is just removing his, his headgear already. He, like one of the, of the pieces that uh, suggests that he uh, um, has a rank, some sort of social position. And meanwhile, like we don't see his face clearly, but the kids on the ground are painting his portrait here. And they have this small ink stone, the, the black one thing here. They have a brush. They have uh, a piece of fine paper that is placed right on the ground. And it would never be possible in real life. Uh, starting from like the 10th to 13th century common era, there were intellectuals who did like the uh, character here does. They were establishing some schools, uh, but they would never allow uh, their uh, students to use fine uh, drawing materials. It was impossible uh, for financial reasons, for social uh, limitations. Uh, so they would rather draw some characters with a stick just on the ground. And here they have very fine materials. Uh, in the Chinese culture, uh, they are called the four treasures of the intellectual's office. Although they are not made of real like gold or diamonds or whatever, but these are the four uh, treasures. Uh, the brush, the ink, uh, the inkstone to grind ink, and uh, the paper. So four, four treasures. And also, if we look at the initial composition of the fine gathering, of ga gathering of intellectuals, uh, the different kinds of compositions that survived to nowadays, um, the earliest perhaps uh, is from the uh, like 14th century. Uh, we, ca we can notice also the, uh, that there is a character who paints, uh, who actually draws characters, practices calligraphy over a slab of stone, a vertical stella of stone. And here you see one boy painting a face of another boy. So you can uh, imagine that this is like a um, sort of um, a projection of, a, of an ink, uh, or, or, I mean of a stone surface to a human face. And also, uh, in some of those compositions of an intellectual ga gathering, uh, there are scenes of people inviting the, the servants, inviting a guest in. That would be usually um, a, a servant who brings a musical instrument, and then an intellectual uh, uh, arrives uh, a little bit l uh, later, and they, uh, somebody is a greeting from within. But here, the boy is leaving, so everything is completely different, the opposite from what you would expect from the intellectual gathering. And as to the uh, fake uh, signature and a fake seal, mm, uh, this is because the, uh, like the, I would say, 70% of the collection uh, that was um, transferred to our museum in the late 1950s uh, from the collection of um, a French diplomat and his Russian wife. Um, those items were almost all, uh, uh, they were almost copies. There were only few originals, we'll see them later on, uh, but um, it was a certain play of those um, people who were selling, the Europeans, the Chinese art. They were like mm, making, I would say, an, ad an ordeal or sort of um, testing uh, their clients. Would you recognize that there is something wrong with it 
although there is a well-known name and um, there are lots of uh, stamps, uh, seal prints, uh, like the so um, the things that pretend that these items were created in like the 15th century or early 16th century. Uh, but also what's, what's interesting about this item, uh, about this piece, is that there are two uh, inscriptions over there. And they also fake the uh, seals and inscriptions by well-known statesmen of the Ming era of the 15th century. So the people who lived almost in the time when the first picture, the f first parody of the intellectual gathering were crea was created. So the one on the right, uh, as we read the Chinese paintings from right to left, and the one says that um, it's so funny to see the, those children uh, engaging in all those funny activities and we, we can just smile at them while their teacher is like having philosophical dreams. And the um, words they use are actually known from the uh, third century bef uh, before Common Era. The idea of a philosopher who dreamt of himself of, uh, as being a butterfly, then he woke up and he couldn't distinguish reality from the dream or dream from the reality. He was still feeling himself as a butterfly. But on the other side, there is a second uh, um, person who inscribes and they say that he only sympathizes with the poor teacher who will um, wake up and feel and see all the chaos and will be very upset. So the, uh, this is someone who prizes and this is someone who criticizes actually the uh, very idea. Although both uh, inscriptions are fake. Uh, this piece is created much later, I would say like 19th century, like the majority of pieces here. Uh, so, at this point, I would go to the other place. If you look at the back of the uh, scroll, you'll see um, a colophon, a so-called colophon, um, a small uh, strip of paper uh, that notices the author and the uh, subject, and it's usually added later on by a collector or the owner of the scroll. So and, and it says the return from the hunt in the um, winter in, in, in winter mountains in mountains in snow, and if you and nowadays if you enter the same characters in uh, like Google search, you'll be shown the um, uh, hunters in the snow by Bruegel. But uh, actually, this idea of returning from the hunt and um, uh, the, some um, sort of uh, despair of the hunters who didn't succeed much, it was uh, already uh, mentioned in the Chinese poetry like almost 2,000 years ago. And later on in the uh, uh, Song era, that was from the 10th to 13th century common era, um, the subject of hunters in the snowy mountains appear. So this piece is more or less a good, a good copy of the item that would be like 700 years by now. Uh, it was also copied very so many times. And for some reason, uh, the people who created that copy or forgery, if you would like, just sort of a fake, uh, they have put in these characters here. And it says uh, the Chinese name is uh, Lang Shunying. And that was the Chinese name of an Italian Jesuit, Giuseppe Castiglione, who lived from uh, 1688 to 1766. And he served at the imperial court of China. He was engaged in uh, building the European style uh, summer residence in Beijing, uh, in Pekin. And um, he was very talented, but we don't know a single piece by him like that. 
So for some reason, the forgers added his name here. There we had a wintry la landscape, and here is the peak of summer, uh, the festival of dragon boats. You may know about this event like a sports event nowadays. It's like a, sort of a more sort of a sport than a cultural event, but it's uh, very tightly related to the traditions of the southern China. Uh, it has some hints uh, to some uncertainty. Um, you know, to some uh, some festivals we appreciate, we uh, we expect to happen. We are more than positive, like Christmas, like the Latvian Ligo. Everything is positive. But here is the summertime, which is too hot, too uh, dangerous uh, by like the possibility of diseases. And we have to balance that extreme heat. We have to uh, expel those evil spirits that can bring us some epidemies, some, uh, some illnesses. So we go to the... Uh, uh, any beds of water, any rivers, lakes, and we try to worship the uh, opposite element, uh, the element of water, the element of coldness, to bring us some relief from the heat and from possible disease. And all around the southern China, um, it is known as the time for some competition of uh, boats, decorated as mostly as dragons, uh, like here, but sometimes as phoenixes over there on the background. So uh, this uh, uh, landscape is devoted to the uh, day in the year that is called the double fifth, the fifth day of the fifth month in the Chinese traditional calendar that celebrates water and brings health for the whole season, for the whole hot season. What's interesting is that uh, the folk beliefs and the folk practices uh, were also uh, intermingled with, um, intertwined with the ideas by Confucians, who praised a poet uh, who was also a well-known statesman, and he was uh, uh, like an epitome of being loyal, of being uh, straightforward, uh, very uh, able, uh, able to envision fu the future. So this person uh, is known as Chu Yuan, and he lived from uh, from the uh, fourth to uh, third century before Common Era. And he is also considered to be the first poet known before, because the, in the previous centuries, uh, there were no known authors of poetry. And with this uh, personality, we start to speak about the Chinese uh, poetry as something that has an, a real, a particular author. Uh, so uh, he was uh, very um, uh, loyal to his uh, king, or I would say the prince, uh, Wang, uh, of the state of Chu. And, uh, but he was um, so straightforward in his um, uh, talks that he was expelled um, to go to, once he was sent to the north, like to, to, he, he had to spend some time in the north. Then uh, the the king was more or less okay and uh, let him enter the capital again. But then again, for his uh, straightforwardness and for for his uh, will, uh, will to tell the truth about the politics, he was uh, then sent to the southern provinces. And each time, uh, the poet felt like he was very. Um, uh, he was leaving his uh, usual world as if he was sent was sent to barbarians to some wild tribes. Uh, although now these places are very well known for the the cultural events and like, 
But at, those, at that time, it was very heartbreaking for him to be outside of the society, to be somewhere in the wilderness. And he um, imagined himself like traveling a coach um, carried by a dragon and a phoenix. So you see the two boats decorated as a dragon and a phoenix. And eventually uh, the poet suicided because he was again expelled from the court and was about to send um, to some, somewhere outside of his world, I would say. So um, he suicided and the legend says that he was um, like, uh, the, he was so popular in, uh, in the society, like with lay people, that they would uh, go to the um, water, like uh, to, to the, the riverbank, and they would throw um, small treats into the water so the fish would not eat his body, but the, the fish would eat those treats instead. And all that combined of uh, the uh, teachings from Confucians, the folk belief, uh, it all uh, became the um, tradition of celebration of the Duan Wu, the fifth day of the fifth month. And now we are going to proceed to the next thing, which is actually <laughs> related to the, uh, the same celebration. So this scroll shows us lots of details that are related to the same festival, to the same summer festival of the fifth day of the fifth month. And here we see those triangle uh, treats. They are wrapped in uh, banana leaves or palm leaves, bamboo leaves, and inside there is uh, glutinous rice with um, some filling. It could be sweet or meat, all sorts of, actually very tasty, but well. Uh, what's interesting here is that these uh, trees called zongzi and these lychee and um, also other um, like mulberry uh, berries, they are the direct quotes from a land, um, I'm sorry, for, from the still life painted by Giuseppe Castiglione. So the Jesuit uh, monk, the Jesuit uh, painter, and um, the, um, the um, person who served the Chinese emperor trying to instill uh, Christianity on him, the same person addressed the very Chinese traditional things and painted them in the in the sort of uh, mixture of uh, approaches from the European still life painting and also some Chinese painting of uh, birds and flowers because there is no still life in Chinese painting. <laughs> All life is vivid in China. And you can see that there is not only like real life, but also some fantasy. Because here there are, uh, there is a basin here, and there are small creatures, green creatures, I would uh, invite you to approach and see later on. These are frogs, and if you look at uh, pay some attention, you'll notice that these frogs have three legs. So these are magic frogs that bring treasures. Uh, up there, is a sort of a demon, a very small demon, like size of a small bird, I would say. You can compare that to the vase. And the vase itself is also a quote from Giuseppe Castiglione. He, he painted these sort of still lives. Uh, the devil is about to surrender to this person in red. He has a sword, he has some sorts of amulets hanging here from that cloud and this person is the devil tamer uh, the uh, actually the saint uh, and he has uh, uh, there is a real uh, personality behind this imagery he lived in the second century common era and he was the first person to create taoism Taoism as the religion, as a certain uh, uh, 
uh, list of rules like um, not just uh, shamanism, not, not just uh, witchcraft, but also something based on the um, books, or the, on the books they have some obscure meanings. And I've already quoted uh, the philosopher, it was Zhuangzi, who dreamt of himself as being a butterfly. So uh, this person here, he um, uh, just quoted the writings of Zhuangzi, like randomly. But uh, Zhuangzi, uh, the, the writings of Zhuangzi were created like almost five centuries before him. So the uh, uh, language of those writings were quite obscure by the time Zhang, uh, Daolin, uh, started quoting them. So he could, could manipulate those old texts in his favor and to say something, to, to pretend that there is some like huge wisdom behind those texts, although the texts are really funny and, and make us think about them, some like truth, but uh, they are not of religious quality, I would say, or re a religious thing. Nevertheless, uh, now in Taiwan, there is, uh, I, w I would say like the f f 57th generation, uh, hair of the same person who is in, uh, who is a head of the Taoist um, uh, sort of school. So they continue that practice. And um, although his very early ancestor is cons uh, considered like a saint, uh, omnipresent and uh, expelling demons like in a common <laughs> place, um, uh, but still uh, like the practice and like the, the, the personal approach to the, some um, religious things, like the, it's not like Jesus Christ who has no like descendants. Here, here you can see the, the, the direct hairs of the same person who is a saint here. Uh, so, uh, f f f also uh, this part is quite interesting, is um, a quote from the Christian religious painting. And uh, although we know in the Chinese art, the, in the Chinese folk art also related to Taoism, that there are some images of fairies, of goddesses bringing a kid as an auspicious sign of uh, uh, many hairs, many uh, uh, many children, uh, many talented children. Uh, it also has some relations to the um, Christian imagery that the Chinese saw, understood that the icons of the Christians were something <laughs> like interesting things, so they copied that as well. And unfortunately, we don't know the author of this piece, otherwise um, I would be like, I would be worshipping them. It's, it's a, real ni a really nice piece. In my talk today, uh, there were statesmen, there were servants, there were um, hunters, there was a male saint, there were uh, devils and uh, fantastic creatures and real um, animals, but it looked like we almost skipped women. Uh, but the imagery of women in Chinese art uh, is very vivid and we know about the very early depictions of um, ladies in waiting, the court ladies from the 6th century common era. And uh, this piece uh, is almost an icon. We can talk about icons uh, in relation to the Chinese art, uh, which is circular um, art for, first and foremost, but still mm, every creation implies that uh, the painting harmonizes the place it, it is uh, placed in. And the uh, images of uh, either lay women or uh, women of um, some, like some historical figures, famous women of the past, or a goddess, that would bring something positive to the place. And there is a little bit of con controversy now. I'm discussing uh, the personality of the uh, deity here, of the goddess, who she is. Because uh, the uh, 
Chinese uh, who served as a secretary and he also compiled the catalog of the uh, paintings for the French ambassador and his wife. Um, he, uh, he wrote that this uh, persona, this goddess is Si Wang Mu, the mother uh, of, of Western uh, part, who lives in the um, uh, sacred, like in a very distant sacred mountain, and uh, she may um, uh, don't uh, she, she grows uh, the peaches of long life in his garden that uh, it, it takes like three thousand years for a peach to ripen and then if she bestows a peach to, on somebody uh, to somebody then that person would live forever so the peaches of immortality of eternal youth uh, on the other hand uh, she has some um, twin personalities in the Chinese um, beliefs, folk beliefs, and at the same time this, uh, this goddess could be uh, Magu, uh, the hemp maiden. Uh, so um, the hemp maiden was also considered a um, goddess of uh, long life. Uh, she would give to this long life to both men and women, but usually um, she was more on the like female side and she would be uh, like more approachable while Si Wang Mu is somewhere in the mountains in the faraway garden with her uh, peaches. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this personality, this character is more like within, within the human world. So this is, um, there is still some debate about the goddess, but anyway, she's carrying a peach. She has a phoenix by her side, and the phoenix was uh, considered the epitome of the fem feminine nature, and uh, also uh, an embodiment of the empress. While the dragon stands for an emperor, the um, phoenix stands for an empress. Uh, what's interesting to, uh, about this painting as well is that it is based on the painting of a court lady just carrying a jar by um, an un unknown painter of the Qing dynasty, which is like from the uh, mid 17th, uh, late 17th to early 20th century. So uh, there is a prototype for that, but it's much more modest, and that's just a girl with a jar. And here we have lots of other details and the phoenix here. And this is quite an interesting hybrid, I would say, of uh, like the art, the secular art and the hints to some goddesses, but still the goddess in question. So, so far we call her Sivangmo, the, the upper one, <laughs> the, the less approachable ones. But the, my work, my research continues so perhaps like <laughs> in, in like in a few years if i can invite you to kiev i will show you the same scroll but with the different inscription so thank you so much